see somebody near you struggling to find that or without a Bible, if you could share with them, that would be great. For those of you who've been with us for a while, if you have your John notebooks, now's the time to take that John notebook out, make some notes. John chapter 20, because today, really, we're just going to focus on two verses. But they're very important verses. They represent... So, so John, who wrote the Gospel of John, as you know, was the brother of James. They were called the Sons of Thunder, a couple fishermen from Galilee who lived 2,000 years ago. And they were probably called the Sons of Thunder because they kind of had hot tempers and they were instead of bold personality. John has undergone a change. He, he and his brother spent three years with Jesus and were eyewitnesses to Jesus' life, his miracles, his death, and his resurrection. And John decided to take it upon himself to write it all down. And we all say, thank you, John, for doing that. John knows he's not the first person to do it. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke exist as gospel books, but now John's is being added in to, to kind of complete this fourfold telling of the story of Jesus. And uh, by that time, the time that John writes, it would have been sewn into a book like you have today, not just a scroll, but a, but a book book. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all combined together and all called the gospel. So when people start talking about how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John disagree with each other and there are differences and contradictions, etc., Keep in mind that uh, for many reasons that's wrong, but one of them is that John knew about Matthew, Mark, Luke when he wrote his gospel, so intentionally made his um, slightly different from theirs, including material that they may not have included or extra comments about things that he, know, he knew that they didn't include for whatever reason they had. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John were these are friends. They agree with each other. So we come now to John chapter 20, and uh, but let me begin it this way because we're going to, this is, today's going to be a shorter than normal sermon, so it's only going to be an hour, hour and a half. <laughs> not, not really, but it's going to be a shorter than normal sermon, and, and what we're going to do is going to be more ambitious than what we usually do together. We're going to deal with belief itself. So if, if you're a skeptic and you're here today, we're going to give you a start. Um, this won't answer all of your questions at all. It'll just give you a start. And, and let me say at the beginning, if you have more questions, trust me that when I say that the answers are there. The Christian church, the teachings of Christ, have now been on the earth for 2,000 years under heavy attack. And yet, here we are. The answers are there, in other words, and if you need me to point you in a direction, I'd be glad to do that. Um, just write me or contact me. But today, verses 30 and 31, let's do this. Would you just read those two verses right there by yourself? John 20, 30, and 31. Just read those two verses and see what that sounds like to you. We'll read those again, but if you would, just go ahead and start your thinking process on those two verses and what it is that John is trying to say 2,000 years ago. But let me introduce the topic this way. Would you guys say belief? Uh, you know it's the same as the word faith. In the Old Testament, the same as the word trust, but would you say belief? Um, belief in the Bible doesn't just, you know, we use the word belief, we kind of throw it out there all the time, um, like it's wishful thinking. But belief in the Bible meant that you agreed with God. That's not all, though, because the demons agree with God. You agree with God, plus 
you attach yourself to God. That's that idea of taking hold of him. So you agree with him and what he says in Scripture, and there's that relationship component, you've attached yourself to him. So belief is, is my main point is to say this at the beginning, belief is not a small thing. So people think, well, you've got to start with belief, and then you work yourself up to all these other things. Not at all. Once again, 1 John chapter 5 tells us that belief is the thing that conquers the world. Belief is the victory that overcomes the world. It's, it's faith. So to believe something and to truly believe it is not a little thing. Belief is the greatest thing. Can I get you to agree with me on that? But belief is the greatest thing you will do. It's the greatest thing you will do. If, if, if we won't, don't, don't just jump off. Say, oh, belief, belief. Yeah, I know what belief is. Take a second and say, what, what is belief really? Belief is agreeing with God and then attaching myself to God. It's not just saying something, it's doing something. It's not just a one decision I made 20 years ago. It's the decisions I make every single day. Belief is not a little thing. Belief is the greatest thing you will ever do. We use it every day about all kinds of things that we do not doubt for a minute. Um, And this includes Christian things and non-Christian things. but, But just listen for just a second to see if you can follow me with this. We believe that life has meaning, right? We just, or at least we act like it does, because why else would we get up in the morning and go do something? We believe life has meaning, right? We believe that love is real, don't we? And at least we act like we believe it's real because we go and do all these things and and, uh, we seek after love, we try to give love, we, we act like it's real, we probably believe that love is real. Here's another one. We believe that life is worth living. If you're here right now and you do not believe that life is worth living, then we expect that yours may be over soon. You cannot go through day after day after day and truly believe that life is not worth living. People who live, people who keep going, people who keep waking up must believe that life is worth living. Or at least they're acting like they believe it. And that's true of atheists as well as Christians, isn't it? Because if nothing matters and life is not worth living and there is no meaning, then you've got to justify yourself, atheist. Why are you here? Why is it better for you to be alive than dead? And of course, there's, there's no answer to that. They're simply responding by faith on it. Here's another one. We believe that there is good and evil, don't we? Or at least we act like we believe that almost every single day. And one more. Uh, I thought this was an interesting one. We believe that this world is real and history is real and not just memories implanted in our minds a couple of minutes ago. You believe that? How do you know that's true? Couldn't all of this have been just a memory that was placed in your brain? That none of the past actually existed? And then just boom. Boom. Somehow it's just been popped in your brain. How do, you, how do you prove that that's not the case? You, you can't. We all simply take it by faith. Whether you're a Christian or an atheist, you're taking all this by faith, and you're either saying it or you're acting like it because you're still here today, right? So belief is not a little thing like, like there are people who follow science and then there are people who follow faith. No, we all follow faith. Every single one of us, because none of those things that I just mentioned can be proven by science. None of them. And yet, they're probably things we do every single day and probably the most important things to us. Am I I making that up? The meaning in life, purpose in life, love, those things are probably the most important things to you, right? Probably more important than science. How many of you would rather have love than know about mitochondria? (laughs) Okay, but how many of you are glad your doctor knows about mitochondria? Okay. How many of you would rather have a deep, fulfilling sense of meaning in life than to know about the third moon of, I don't know, Jupiter? I don't know anything about 
I mean, which one of of those would you rather have? You say, thank you scientists for telling us these things because they're interesting, but we don't care. What we really care about is meaning, purpose, satisfaction, joy, the deep cravings of my soul. I can get through my entire life without knowing how mitochondria work. I can, I can get through my whole life that way. But I don't want to live very long without knowing the meaning, the purpose of life and where love comes from. Right? So we can't just act like, well, there's science and there's faith. Every, to say that is to ignore the fact that every human being is after something that science can't prove. What does that mean? That must mean something. But we take these things on faith every single day. So since we all, atheists and Christians, since all of us are using faith every single day, then it's time we use it for the most important thing. And John, who wrote chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, would want us to use that faith, the faith that every atheist uses every single day, the faith that every Christian uses, wants us to use that faith to do what? To believe what? To believe that Jesus is the Christ, is the Son of God, and that by believing, like really believing, we may have life in his name. The most important thing we could ever get from faith is that. We use faith every day, so we want, and we're not going to try to be sophisticated. We're like, you have faith and I have reason. No, we're all using faith every day. Admit it, right? Let's admit it. But here's the most important thing we could ever use our faith on. I mean, we could use it on every page of the Bible. We could use it on quite a few things. But here's the most important thing we could ever use our faith on to finally decide to believe that Jesus is the Savior King who died to save me from my sins, overcame death to give me eternal life. Everybody, and in a moment, in a breath, Christianity answers the questions of meaning, purpose, what happens next, love, right and wrong. In a moment, Christianity is answering all those questions that science cannot answer by itself. So my question is, do you believe that today? John chapter 20. Let's do this. Let's stand up for for just a second. You've been sitting long enough. John chapter 20. And let's, let's do this today. We're going to sound kind of crazy. We're going to read verses 30 and 31 all at the same time, out loud in whatever Bible translation you have. Ready? John 20, verse 30. And truly Jesus did... Um, let's stop after verse 31, everybody. Okay, that, that was good. And all the people said, Amen. but let me just, let me just do a, a brief prayer here because this is really important. Let's all, all of us hear this brief prayer. God, speak to me. All of us. Let's take that second. God, speak to me. Now, be careful. Don't ask him to do that unless you're serious about it. Father God, I'm listening. Father, we, we, we need your help because we know that our ears are not the best, that our understanding is not the best. We're humble to admit those things to you. Please speak to us and change our lives today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Oh, in just a few moments, I'm going to try to do something to you that I'd with you guys that I don't ever do, and that's to introduce you to my skeptical side. The skeptical version of Trey, and we're going to call him Doubting Thomas. And I'm going to try to, I won't press this, but I'm going to try to get you guys to also admit that you have a Doubting Thomas living inside of you. I know. You're not supposed to talk about that person on Sunday mornings. I'm supposed to show you my childlike faith side. 
but I want to show you Doubting Thomas in just a few moments, and you'll, you'll be able to tell when things get scary and change here in just a second. But first, let me just summarize what has happened in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. Can I summarize this? We meet a person, thank you for your permission, we meet a person whose name is Thomas. And Thomas was not there in the first few verses when Jesus appeared in his resurrected body to his apostles. He appeared to them and showed them that he was truly dead, but now is truly alive. Thomas wasn't there. So those apostles who were there, Jesus left, and those apostles went to Thomas and said, Hey, Thomas, I don't... while you stepped out, here's what happened. And now Thomas is left to have to believe what they saw. Thomas has to believe a miracle based on someone else's testimony. And Thomas is going to ask himself this question. How can I believe on Jesus when I've never seen him? That's my first slide today, and I want to get you guys, as that slide comes up, I want to get you guys to say that with me. You find that one there? How can I believe on Jesus when I've never seen that's Thomas's dilemma. Aren't you glad that Thomas had that dilemma? Because somebody say, because that's kind of mind dilemma. In fact, I don't know, 500 plus people that actually did get to see Jesus alive from the dead, but all the rest of us are having to rely on someone else's testimony. Eyewitness report. So Thomas is saying, how can I believe on Jesus when I've never seen him? And he's actually going to say these words. If I don't touch him, his wounds, scars in his hands, going on the side, if I don't, I will by no means believe. The only way I'll ever believe, if I can see for myself, physically touch for myself. And that's a good example of skepticism, right everyone? Because this is quite a miraculous claim. However, all of his friends who are with Jesus are all telling him, we saw Jesus alive from the dead. Thomas said, you're asking me to believe that? Simon Peter, Andrew, and James, and all the rest say, yes. Now, one more time. If Thomas had been there in verses 19 and following, he would not be called Doubting Thomas. He just happened to not be there for whatever reason. And so now he's having to believe based on someone else's eyewitness testimony. So he wants to know, how can I believe on Jesus when I've never seen him? How can I believe on Jesus when I've never seen him? Not only are you asking me to believe in a miracle, you're asking me to believe it based on someone else's testimony. Anybody else been there before? And for you and I, we're holding the testimony in our hands. That Bible is claiming to be the eyewitness report. And now you've got a challenge, don't you, everyone? Because you've got to deal with a side of you that you don't always like. The skeptical side of you. And I want to encourage you today, don't ignore him or her. Don't don't just say, well, I can't deal with you right now, or I just don't want to listen to what you have to say. You're ungodly. Let's take a moment and just admit that our skeptical side has his or her purposes. Our skeptical side is most, for most of us, is in the background, arms crossed, and has this eyebrow that's up, like, Spocks, you know, all the time. All the time. Childlike faith is over there. Childlike faith will believe anything. Stop ignoring me because I will always be here. You will never have genuine faith until you deal with me. You can't just ignore me. I'll always be around. Now, I want you to take a second and you say bad things about me in church on Sunday. But I want you to take a second and be thankful for me. Because if it weren't for me, you'd believe in UFOs. 
you'd believe in Bigfoot. You'd be spending all your money on lottery tickets. If he weren't for me, you'd believe every religion. I helped Pastor Trey write sermons. He hates it when I come into his office and sit down in his fancy chair. Now he's got to have a conversation with me. He's got to deal with me. Because I keep you out of trouble. You, if it wasn't for me, you'd fall for every scam out there. And let's face it, sometimes you're proud of me, aren't you? When you got a good deal on something... When somebody didn't entrap you in some scam, you go around proud of your skeptical side. I serve a purpose, don't I? When somebody hollers miracle, my eyebrow goes up. <laughs> and you know you're going to have to convince me. What's it going to take to convince me? Not ignore me, convince me. How can I believe on Jesus when I've never seen him? By the way, when something bad happens in your life, I mean bad, not uncomfortable. When something bad happens in your life, Doubting Thomas is going to try to take the driver's seat. How many of you have found that out already? He's going to throw doubts out there that you would never have entertained before. He will step to the front with his arms crossed and be skeptical of everything you ever thought you believed. Be very careful not to let Doubting Thomas take the driver's seat. He has a really good purpose when he's back there. And you've got to deal with him. But in the end, if he'll stay right there, and you sit down and talk with them from time to time, then you can step out and make the final decision. Right? And that's mostly what you do. But beware of this. Maybe jot this down because it's coming. Something horrible happens in your life. Doubting Thomas is going to step forward and say, why is this happening to me? Is there even a God? Is the Bible even true? Do my loved ones even love me? Do I even have a purpose in life? And all of a sudden, he just runs everything. Don't let him do that. That's not his purpose. His purpose is to be an advisor, and you've got to make the final decisions, okay? Hang on to that for just a moment. Everybody ask this question with Thomas with me. How can I believe on Jesus when I've never seen him? And here's the simple answer, and you're not going to love it, but here's the simple answer. I can believe on Jesus based on what is written in the Bible. I know that's, that doesn't sound very exciting, but hang on for just a second. I can believe on Jesus based on what is written in the Bible. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, and by signs he means miracles, Right? Which miracles should be pretty good evidence that Jesus is more than just a man. Right, everyone? That his claims were true. He did, more, he did more than what John wrote. And he did more than what Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote. John says in chapter 21, in fact, if we were to write it all down, there wouldn't be enough room for all the books. But I've given you these, notice what he says, which are not written in this book, but these are written. I picked these because I thought they might be the most important for you to know. They're connected to his identity. If you believe these, you'll know that Jesus is the Son of God, is the Savior. And you can believe in it based on what I have given you, these signs, the book of John. These I did write so that you might believe, everyone say believe, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Because, because it's all about belief. Belief is the key that unlocks all the doors in Scripture. And without it, you can't go anywhere in a relationship with God. It's all about belief. So, that's the trick. You have just answered the question by saying something that skeptical version of you does not like. 
Will you read it with me? I can believe on Jesus based on what is written in the Bible. Based on what is written in the Bible. The Bible was written so long ago. So you Okay, I understand what you're saying. It doesn't matter how long it's been since the Bible was written. What matters is how long it was between the events and the Bible's writing, which wasn't very long. I understand what you're saying. But still, these claims are pretty, pretty spectacular. And you're asking me to believe a miracle, number one, which we don't see too often these days. I won't discount all miracles because it's be, be impossible to do. But number one, you're asking me to believe a miracle. Number two, you're asking me to believe somebody else's word for it. And we're going to have to do some thinking about that. Because normally this would be where I'd step in and keep you out of trouble. But I understand why you're asking these questions of me. So you spend some time with Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas wants... Remember this, if you would. Doubting Thomas always wants to be 100%. He always wants that. And that's fine, because childlike faith is like at 4%, right? <laughs> Doubting Thomas always wants to be 100%. Now, reason with Doubting Thomas. What are you 100% on? Especially when it comes to history. Everyone? Nothing. I wasn't there. I didn't get to see it for myself. So, you, you like to use the example of Alexander the Great. Fine. Alexander didn't claim to rise from the dead. No. That's right. He didn't. But the claim doesn't matter. It's either reliable historical evidence or it's not. Is there evidence for the existence of Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar? You believe that every single day then let's be fair. Is there evidence for the identity and the resurrection of Jesus as a historical event? Tons. More than for the existence of a person named Alexander the Great. But it's different for some reason. I don't, Skeptical Trey has a very hard time because these are miraculous claims. Well, here's the thing. It's not just that John's eyewitness testimony is the best evidence. It's that John's eyewitness testimony, verses 30, 31, is the only evidence. Like all of it's gone, right? You can, yes, you can do archaeology. You can find out these were real places. And, and even atheists will agree there was a person named Jesus of Nazareth. He was crucified by Roman execution. There were a group of people who all suddenly believed that he rose from the dead even skeptics, and even enemies. But they don't believe that the best way to explain that is by the resurrection of Christ. They believe the best way to explain that is through hallucination. 500 people all hallucinated the same thing. And they hallucinated it to the point they were willing to suffer and die for it. Everybody, that doesn't happen. That's not a good explanation because it doesn't happen. Besides, the disciples knew about hallucinations. They knew about ghosts. So well, somebody, the best way to explain it is that the disciples all made it up. And we, as we saw in our hoax skit, a group of people make it up and then are willing to suffer and die a horrible death for it. People don't do that. That's not a good explanation either. So once you've ruled out the explanations, what are you left with, everyone? That the best way to explain the facts that we all agree on is that Jesus actually rose from the dead. That's the other alternative that Th Doubting Thomas will not accept. So let's just be fair. You're never going to get Doubting Thomas to 100%. That's too much to ask about. He's not 100% about anything. He's not 100% about the fact that he exists. Right? Is that fair to say? He's not 100% about anything. He's always going to be a doubter, 
And that's why he is there. That's why he is who he is. So do not think that you can wait to decide about Christ when you're doubting Thomas is 100%. That's not skepticism. That's radical skepticism. And what that means is there is no amount of evidence that would make me believe. And if that's your view, then be fair. Be fair and say, I don't know if Alexander the Great exists. I don't know if Julius Caesar exists. I don't know if my ancestors exist. And I don't know what the meaning of life is. And I don't know the purpose of life. And I don't know if love is real. And I don't know if right and wrong exists. And then you've got to justify why you woke up this morning. So, doubting Thomas I've listened to your reasoning. You've been working on this, and I, I appreciate how hard you're working on this to show me that it's reasonable to believe that Jesus' resurrection was an actual historical event. I, I've listened to that. And I've got to admit, you brought me from 15% up to 55%. That's all I can do. Now the rest is up to you. You don't have to get Doubting Thomas to 100%. You have to get him to the place where he says, it's just as reasonable to believe that as it is to believe X, Y, and Z. If you get him to that point, then you're going to have to jump the rest of the way. Now, Doubting Thomas doesn't understand why you would jump. Why, why would you jump? Because he's about safety. He keeps you safe. But you've decided... That you've got Doubting Thomas to the point where he goes, you know, to be fair, it's just as reasonable to believe in the historicity of the resurrection of Christ as it is to believe in these other historical events. You're going to have to jump the rest of the way. I'll never get him to get to 100% anyway. I'll never get him to 90%, depending on how good he is. So the rest of it, I'm going to have to leap. I'm going to have to jump. And Doubting Thomas wants to know, why would you make that jump? Stay safe. Just stay in doubt. Stay skeptical. Why would a person want to make that leap? Even if it's a running leap, why make it? And you know why you make it. Because this is not a little thing. Much is at stake. If you do nothing, if you do decide to stay with Doubting Thomas, let him take the driver's seat, never make the run, never make the jump, are you safe? According to Christianity, you're definitely not safe. Right? If you decide you're going to take the leap, why would you take the leap? What would so motivate you? I mean, in normal circumstances, you know, the guy comes to your door to sell something and Doubting Thomas is like, I don't know, I'll give you 55% on that one. You'd be like, no thanks, and shut the door. Why would you, 55%, 54%, why would you decide to, to risk it? You know the alternative is just never to risk it, but why do you decide to risk it and become the people that you are? What is at stake? Yes, yes, and... You you cannot simply go through life and live your 90 years without knowing the things that are at the very heart of life. Like, we cannot be okay with that. We cannot be okay with, now I have children, now I have grandchildren, and I still don't know, I don't have a clue about the meaning of life, the purpose of life, where right and wrong come from, that love is real, that there is beauty That there is a God by the things my soul craves. I cannot simply press through life like a creature. A squirrel would be okay with that. Everybody say, I'm not a squirrel. I need a reason to get up in the morning. I need a purpose that will drive me forward and give me a reason for my life. And I don't want it made up. How many of you are sure that if you just made up a reason, you'd be happy with that? Christians are not people who follow blind faith. I guarantee you every single one of you has had your faith tried many different times. 
I, I guarantee many of you have a better doubting Thomas inside of you than a lot of skeptics do who've decided to be atheists. You doubt. You have, you have moments of deep, dark doubt. And yet, still, here you are because you made the final decision not doubting Thomas. And you decided the leap is worth it. I cannot live another day without knowing and deciding on the most important things of all life. And it's not just I think it. Every human being who's ever lived has craved in his soul for a creator, for the supernatural. Why is that? Because it's real. Science can't prove it, or else everything proves it. Your doubting Thomas says, okay, you give me a little bit more time with the research. Give me a little bit more time with the New Testament scholars, with the history scholars, and you'll get me to the point where I say, okay, I give you permission, but the leap is up to you. That's all I'll give you. When you get doubting Thomas inside of you to that point, then you're ready. There's nothing else holding you back to take the jump. Belief is not a small thing. Belief is the greatest thing. We use it every single day about all kinds of things that we do not doubt for a minute. It's time to use it about the most important thing of all life. Do I believe, I mean, do I truly believe that Jesus is my Savior King? Do I believe that? Let's all take just a moment, and uh, this is the time in the church service where I stop talking, and I give the things over to the Holy Spirit. You're about to hear a voice inside of you that is either saying something to you like, that's your faith, or saying something to you like, what do you really believe? You're about to hear a voice inside of you, and that is the voice of God. I'm going to take just a moment to be quiet and let you spend some time in prayer, and then we'll sing a song together. But as you're praying, if you could just kind of make your mind quiet and just listen to what it is that God has to say. After all, we started the whole service that way, didn't we, everybody? We said, God, speak to me. And he just did.